Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Ryan White. Um, as you heard, I, uh, I'm the uh, owner of Hatteras Jack. It's a family-owned business here on Hatteras Island. I'm the third generation in there. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, about rod building, um, particularly, you know, being this is a surf fishing event. I want to uh, I want to focus on uh, on surf fishing. So uh, you know, we found uh, remnants of surf fishing all over all over the world. Uh, just recently, some stuff found in Mesoamerica in one of the areas that I go in Mexico for my recreational fishing. Um, it's uh, so you know, surf fishing is more than just you know, just a just a recreation. It's you know, it's a it's a connection to our past, and uh, it's a it's a connection to where you know we used to have to forage for food and you know hunt for food and fish for fo food and you know uh, surf fishing and fishing in general just makes us a better people by knowing how to provide for ourselves should need arise if nothing else. But it's a lot of fun also. So um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the rod building techniques that were used in the early days of rod building, not necessarily uh, prehistoric rod building, because I'm not really sure about that. But um, you know, as far as rod building, let's say from the turn of the century, when the when the recreational fishing thing started kicking off, you know, with the uh, uh, wooden rods, fiberglass or uh, bamboo rods, which. Al was friendly enough to bring one by. The techniques for building the rods themselves, not necessarily the makeup, but the techniques have really not changed since rod building came into play as modern rod building, you know, is right now. Um, the guides are still held on mostly by thread. I think this might have a little duct tape on it, but <laughs> modern, modern repair. But the guides are held on by thread. They're put on, you know, rods are built, they start out as just a bare dowel, whether it be wood, whether it be fiberglass, whether it be carbon fiber, whether it be some of the new super materials such as nanotube technology, graphenes, um, nanocilia fibers, all these things are going into, uh, all these things are going into fishing rods now. But you turn the guy, you put the, chuck the rod blank up into the lathe, lay it down and you have a loom which holds a, or a thread carriage, which holds the thread and puts tension on it. And you put the guides on with thread. The materials have changed, the technique hasn't. You glue your real seat on just as they did in the old days. You glue your handle on just as they did in the old days. The difference is the materials that we're using. So this is a good example of what rods used to be. It's bam, it's a, uh, I presume this is bamboo, Al? Bamboo, yeah. So this is a bamboo rod. This was actually taken and hand split into wedges and glued together. Uh, some of the older wooden rods were actually uh, dowels turned on wood lathes for taper and uh, different powers. Um, the, uh, the rods used to, you notice this rod has guides on both sides of it. So the older rods used to take a set, even some of the fiberglass. So they'd eventually get a bend in it. Whatever side you used more to fight fish or cast would take a bend. So that's why they have guides on both sides of it. When the rod would take a bend, you can see this comes apart here, they would take it and flip it over and use it on the other side till the bend came out. That was a long time ago. They were, uh, I'll also touch on, these are agate ring guides, I believe. If you look at them, they're red. Um, this is what they used to use, metal frames tack welded together with uh, agate rings pressed into them or glued into them. The next thing that came along after the, after the bamboo and the wood turn, uh, was fiberglass, you know, early composites. So we have a couple of examples of that here. This was actually one that my, uh, my grandfather redid, I don't know, 100 years ago or so. No. But anyhow, this is, a, this is a fiberglass rod. And fiberglass is still around today as far as rod building goes and materials go. It's, a, it's used not so much as a, as a base material anymore, but it's used a lot of times to make a more durable rod. A lot of times it's used to aid in the zoning of the rod 
And the zoning of the rod is what characteristics the tip, midsection, and butt have. So if you want a lighter tip with a more powerful bottom end, you would put glass into the tip and carbon into the bottom end. So that would give you a better zoning. But glass is still used today. Phenomenal, super durable, um, did not have the best life expectancy, and uh, also was not, you know, not powerful. So you, you only could get so much out of glass. Now being as we're, we're on the Outer Banks where the, uh, where the bait caster is king, you know, most of the rods down here that we've built on the Outer Banks for the past 40, 50 years have been bait casting rods. Uh, bait casting rods tend to produce the best distance and they, uh, they give you a whole lot more power on the cranking than the spinning reel does. And uh, that's been one of the big things down here as Mr. Uh, Tommy over there talked about before, distance, uh, distance makes all the difference down here a lot of times. So in, uh, in, in the search for distance, fiberglass turned into S-glass. And then after the S-glass revolution, came graphite or carbon fiber. Um, the carbon fiber has been a, a light year leap in the manufacture of fishing rods. Anything from, uh, anything from sensitivity to distance to, um, to recovery, hook set, everything is better with a carbon fiber rod. Does anybody have any questions? Carbon fiber? So, the materials we're using on these rods, while the technique is the same, instead of using cork or wood for the handles, we're now using EVA shrink tube. of modern components versus old components. You guys can pass these around. So what I have here is I have a modern day titanium guide. I have an early model steel guide. Both are ceramic rings. Pass those around. And I have a, a traditional cork ring grip and then we have something more modern which is a formed EVA grip and then some of the more modern rods don't even have any grips so there's a lot of different styles of rod building as you'll see with uh, some of the rods I have up here you have the the decorative end of it as as rods as are tools and when you get into you know anything any kind of fine handcrafted tool they eventually become an extension of what you are you know old rifles tend to have engravings in them you know I know some carpenters will have their handle you know set up their handles a certain way for their hammers uh, and as a tool a fishing rod should be part of you when you go to build a custom rod, the one, you know, there's, there's a lot of good custom rod builders on the Outer Banks right now. And, you know, you go to different guys for different styles. Um, when you go to a custom rod builder, they're going to fit you out for your body, your body. And as Mike said earlier, you know, he's, uh, <laughs> there's, uh, there's rods for the, for the young man that want to go out and, you know, conquer the world with a fishing pole. And then there's rods for the guys that just want to sit back and relax and trying to get the most out of what they can give. So the, the rod builder is going to fit you up, particularly for the style of reel that you're going to use, whether it be a conventional or a spinning or if you want something that goes both ways, something like this rod does, um, you're gonna start out with that. Uh, I typically use a build sheet which has all the specifications on it. 
So first off, we'll take the blank. All right, well, I want a long rod for drum fishing. So we'll say, all right, well, we're going to get you an eight and bait blank. You know, let's say the 1449 is going to be your rod. So we'll write down to 1449. We'll take the blank then and take you out into the, into the parking lot, get you to set up. We'll take your measurements. And as far as measurements go when you're, when you're building a custom rod, it, uh, there's a hundred different ways that people measure them. Some guys will take them from the center of your chest. Some guys will take it from the underarm. Some guys will take it, you know, arms to the side. Whatever way it goes, it typically winds up being very similar to what, you know, each other. So if you take this measurement versus this measurement versus this measurement, you all kind of see where they go. They're all the same. So regardless of the style they use to measure you out, most of them are going to be very, very on point. Um, the next thing you do is you're, uh, you check to see what grips you want. And the grips are as vast as, as you can imagine. Like I just sent a couple of uh, couple little samples around. Uh, shrink tubes very popular these days. There's some really uh, down here in the southeast, very popular. Shrink tube, maybe some EVA or some cork on it. Uh, slim and trim seems to be the, uh, the style down here. Whereas if you go up to Montauk, it's the whole different, whole different idea. Everybody's taking super skinny rods and putting big fat grips on them and, you know, doing designs in the grip spirals and checkerboards and things. It's, uh, so there's, there's different grip styles all around. Um, regionally, we have a whole lot of different rod building styles. Um, the one that's getting, there's a rod getting passed around right now that has no grips on it whatsoever. That's kind of the, the style that I personally like to build. Uh, super slim, super trim, just nothing on it other than what you need. Versus, this was my grandfather's style of doing things. He wouldn't send a rod out the door without a diamond wrap on it. You know, that was, that was his signature. It had a diamond wrap on it or it didn't go out the door. It had under wraps on it, which is the black color that you see on this rod. Um, under wraps were initially to keep the guides from digging into the, uh, into the, into the composite when you use the rod. Um, today with modern day materials and uh, resins and you know, high durometer uh, uh, resin, the, the, the under wraps aren't as big a deal anymore. You don't need them. Uh, but there's a lot of guys that still put like a faux under wrap on for the decorative end of it. Uh, you'll notice on the rod it's going around, there are no under wraps on. Um, the under wraps on this guy, are go they go completely through from one side to the other. Complete what they call a full under wrap. A lot of the rod builders now that are doing the, uh, the under wrap look is they're doing a wrap, then the over wrap, and this wrap down here only goes from point A to point B. So it's, it's less weight, it's not needed, but you still get the decorative aspect of it. Um, on the decorative side of it, this is what's called a diamond wrap. Super basic, it's uh, you know, just kind of your, what you would consider an entry level into rod building and decorative wrapping and rod building. Um, they have gone to, a, you can buy books by Dale Clements, that'll get into the, the theory of rod wrapping, and there's a lot of math you can get into. Um, but I mean, as far as you, it, you can go as far as you want to go on the decorative side of rods. I mean, there's some really super stuff out there. Um, I have a guy that works for me that does weaving, and uh, you actually make pictures out of the, uh, out of the thread. Uh, it's very similar to a cross stitch pattern. So that's been a, that's kind of comes and goes in time. Right now, the, the trend seems to be the, the cross wraps and complex cross wraps. Um, a few years ago, the weaving thing was the, was the real hot ticket. And uh, who knows what it's gonna be next. Um, any questions on decorations or grips, anything like that? Any questions as far as how to rod building, how to choose blanks. All right, so what Al's asking is, what are, the, what are the different grades of carbon and what are the different grades of carbon do? So 
As far as carbon fiber right now, it pretty much depends on how far you want to go into the technology aspect of it. Um, there's basic carbon fiber, uh, your cheaper carbon fiber. It's almost like a human hair. So if you look at a human hair under a microscope, you see it has little flakes and things that stick off of it, like little tree branches. Well, the cheaper carbon fiber has a lot of those. So in turn, you're not able to pack as many fibers into a certain area. The higher modulus or better carbon fibers that they make have less and less of the little strands and inconsistencies on them. So you're able to pack more carbon fiber into a certain space. That's where you get into like uh, your modulus of the carbon fiber. Um, there are a lot of additives that they're doing now into carbon fiber. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the nanotube technology and nanocilia technology. Um, the weak point in any composite has always been the resin. So uh, like uh, the company I worked with a lot, they do a lot of autoclaving in the, in the past to remove as much resin as they could from the composite, which is what's called a resin lean composite. Uh, the resin in the composite is what breaks down over time. Uh, more so than any other part of it. So the, up until this nanotechnology revolution in carbon fibers, the, the, the autoclave was the, was the king. Now it's used to monitor or control the resin content. Um, what they're doing now with the resin is they're emulsifying nanocilia fibers, which are small spherical uh, cilia fibers. Uh, to displace resin. Um, they're also in the past uh, developed by the University of Manchester, I believe, in 2003, they found the graphene molecule. The graphene molecule is a single, or a, a two-dimensional uh, layer of carbon fiber. It's a single molecule thick, and they're making it now in sheets and it's 200 times stronger than steel, harder than diamond, but still has elastic properties. So even though something super strong and super hard, it's able to stretch. So it's perfect to go into fishing rods, skis, um, tennis rackets, golf club shafts. Um, all of this stuff is, is a great place for this uh, material that they found. They're emulsifying it in rubber now to put into waders, uh, shoes, running shoes. It's, uh, they're getting ready, they're using it and uh, working on figuring out how to use it in batteries. They're using it in uh, the medical field, inlaying graphene tattoos. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very good conductor of electricity. So you don't want to put your fishing poles with it in a, uh, in a telephone line or a lightning storm. But uh, this, this has come about um, in the last, you know, under 20 years, and they're, they're putting it into the resin of the fishing rods. So normally, when you would have a, uh, could I get a, if I could get a, a volunteer up here with me for a second, I'll show you the benefits of graphene versus an old school carbon. Any volunteers? Anybody want to try this? All right, so this this is a super this is a super light uh, graphene rod. Normally, if you would take a a fiberglass or a, a carbon fiber rod and do what I'm getting ready to do with it, it would be in multiple pieces. So go ahead and lift, take it up high. So if you were to do that with the regular graphite rod, it would explode. By adding the nano the nanofibers into the resin, uh, particularly the graphene, it allows the, the resin to stretch. So it, it doesn't, it, it, where it would normally what they call lock up and break, this allows it to stretch even further without failure. So it's been, you know, on the rod builder's side, it's been a huge leap with the nano, with the nano, with the, well, it's a, if you want to look it up on the, on the internet, it's a nanotube technology is what it is. Um, there's a lot of different companies using it right now, but it, it enables something that's light and thin to become very, very strong. And, uh, 
you know, it has some incredible properties. So this has been huge, particularly for a rod building side, because when somebody brings a broken rod back, you have to fix it. <laughs> so if they can't, if you if you take all the oops factor out, it uh, it really helps on the on the breakage factor, you know. And since we've uh, started doing stuff like this, you know, with the this is actually a tuna jigging rod or a popping rod for a stick bait rod. But since we started doing things like this, I mean, you know, breakage has just gone whew, straight down. So it's it's saved uh, it saved a lot of money on the manufacturing end for sure. But it's it's also produced an amazing, amazing product. Um, some of the other, some of the other things that uh, have gone into uh, into carbon here lately. They've got some new wrapping techniques. Um, they're uh, uh, on the mandrel side. Um, new uh, new machines that wrap tighter and hold more pressure on. That kind of you know get the same uh, the same effect as autoclaves. Um, there have been, uh, you know, new mandrels coming out with new tapers that are that are changing up a bit. So the number of guides that go on a rod, what controls that or what determines that? Um, number one, there's a there's a couple of different thought processes. You have what's called the cone of flight, which is don't have an example of that, which is larger guides and fewer of them. Uh, that's a traditional mono filament style guide train. Um, and you have the opposite of it, which is floating around out here, the little trout rod, which has micro guides, which is, you know, a modern day braid style configuration. Um, as far as that's on a spinning, as far as the, uh, the guides on like, let's say a, uh, a conventional rod, how many guides am I gonna put on a conventional rod? It's gonna determine by the size of the guide and the deflection of the rod. So if you have a very fast action rod, in other words, a fast action rod only bends right in the tip of the rod. So this is a moderate, what's called a moderate fast, if you would. So this isn't a, uh, stick it down. Okay, you slipped up on it. You see how this bends about a third of the way down the rod. That's considered a fast action rod. A fast action rod is not going to need as many guides on the bottom side of it because there's less deflection. Um, all you need on a, on a faster rod is, you know, on like say a 13 foot or seven, seven guides on the bait casting side, uh, five or six on a spinning rod side with the, with the mono style um, guide train. Um, something like this, this was designed for braided line. So you see it has smaller guides. The theory of the line going through the blank is, a, is based on a choker system, which is what we have on here. So this knocks the oscillation out early and lays the line down on the blank to eliminate torsional roll of the blank. So when you have guides here on top of your rod and you're casting or fighting a fish, it causes the rod roll to torsionally load side to side. So the lower you can get the guides on the blank, the less torsional effect the line's gonna have on the blank. When you put the line inside the blank, you take all torsional loading out of the picture and you get the choker system. So it works really well with braided line or it works really well with a conventional and monofilament. So that's kind of where the idea came from with running it inside the rod. Also, it takes weight off of having the guides on here. And if you felt the two difference in the two guides that I passed around, the one's made of titanium, the other one's made of steel. You can feel the difference in the weight. So that's kind of a lot of your more modern guides that have gone to titanium have a couple of effects uh, versus stainless. Stainless eventually will rust and it will break eventually. You know, even the best stainless that's out there. Uh, most of the time it happens around the guide feet where water's trapped underneath of the epoxy and it just sits in there and stews, you know, like a nice casserole or chuck roast. But um, it, it will fail. When you put titanium guides on there, it takes the weight off of the tip of the rod. Uh, so the overhung load on the front of the rod, it limit, helps eliminate that or take, lessen it. Um, and they don't corrode. So when you put a set of titanium guides on there, it's there for life, unless you leave the rod outside and let it bake in the sun and, you know, boils the boils the finish off and you have to rewrap it but 
you know, if you put a set of titanium guides on, most of the time, you do it one time. I'm a, I'm a firm believer in the spine of the rod. Um, some of the modern, like, fly rod blanks that G. Loomis is making right now are pretty interesting. They're actually taking, I don't know if you've seen, like, some of the rods that have the tape on it, the carbon fiber tape that makes the X's. Um, they're actually taking that and they're using a braiding machine to braid this tape over top of the blank to the point where it eliminates the spine of the rod. Um, it's good on the manufacturing end. Um, as far as, you know, there's, there's, they're doing a lot of different stuff right now with the torsional loading of rods. So like this little guy right here has a lot of uh, anti-torsional properties to it. So in other words, it doesn't roll side to side. That's supposed to help eliminate the need for the spine, but even on something like this, I find the spine on it. Um, one of the big problems with not finding the spine on a rod that has a spine is when you're uh, when you cast and it's off spine, especially if you're doing if you're casting lures, it winds up the tip winds up rotating after time. You know the flex of the rod back and forth eventually will loosen it up enough to where you're going to have your guides offset to the side like this. So that is the most important reason to find the spine, particularly on a surf rod or a lure fishing rod that's two piece. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you for putting my name on this. <laughs> I'll call you for a credit card number in a little bit.